What's up, everybody? I am the Hook. And I am the Blade. And I am the Bracer. <laughs> this week, we are continuing our conversation uh, with the <laughs> the putrid moldy man himself. He is putrid, he is moldy, but above all, he is a man. <laughs> and <laughs> above all else. We're You're right. <laughs> <laughs> and we're so glad to have him. Um, putrid, I feel like people might be wondering why you go by putrid moldy man. Do you want to just give like a quick explanation? <laughs> yeah. So it is completely unoriginal. This is literally just the name of an enemy from the game Earthbound. Yeah. So oh. if there's anyone out there who is a fan <laughs> of the Earthbound and Mother series, hey, that's cool. So really what we just wanted to establish is that he is not called Putrid Moldy Man for any uh, uh, odor or stench reasons. <laughs> Uh, by all accounts, he smells lovely in person. I wouldn't know. Yeah, when people like first see me by my username and they say, like, what do you want me to call you? <laughs> yeah. Putrid? And, and I'm just like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and it takes me it takes me a second to realize that, oh wait, yeah, that can have a negative connotation, but it doesn't even <laughs> register as to that in my mind because I'm just so used to it. Yeah, we also, um, I mean, I, I, ca- I talked to Putrid before we recorded this, and I was like, I don't know, do you want me to call you, like, Steven? <laughs> <laughs> Putrid, Putrid's fine? Okay, Putrid's fine. We'll, we'll go by Putrid. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pewdie, I, Putrid. I, I call you Pewdie most of the time. Yeah, me too. Pewdie the cutie. <laughs> we had this really long tangent last week when we were recording about dialogue options. And we thought maybe that could be its own episode. So um, what you're about to hear is essentially a conversation that happened in the middle of recording for last week. Um, But hopefully you can enjoy it this time. It is just evaluation of the game's approach to dialogue options. And uh, we'd really like to hear your guys' opinions in the comments. So tell us what you thought, uh, where you stand on dialogue options, what your ideal implementation of it would be. And uh, as always, enjoy the show. When they were talking about the twist where, like, Bayek would have been killed or severely injured, then you would have played as Aya. Yeah. That would have been so out of left field, and I would have loved it. Because it's such a ballsy move. It's like, that's something Rockstar would do. It's not something Ubisoft would do. Yeah. And, and it's, like, not something you would expect with, like, the animus structure. Yeah. But it, it's still, it, 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 it could still work, technically. It would have been perfect. You, you wouldn't, ex- you wouldn't expect it. it. Yeah. It, it would have been great, and but no, they just had to be misogynistic again. <laughs> Same as they did to Syndicate when they made Jacob take up 70% of the screen time in the main story. And most and, and the box art and the trailer. And same as they did to Odyssey when they said you can't have a single playable female protagonist. So And now with Valhalla, I mean, we've been saying from the beginning of the campaign that it's way biased towards male Eivor. And it's like, yeah, we can tell what you're doing, Ubisoft. It's not, it has never been a secret. You can literally read interviews where uh, I think Steven Totolo and Kotaku is like, hey, isn't it kind of weird that you guys are only focusing on the dude? And then the PR lady is like, why don't you shut the hell up, Steven Totolo? <laughs> uh, we, we're not talking about that. <laughs> and it's like, we know I, what's I, Also, what's funny is at, we know what you're I, doing. I, I, I honestly get surprised whenever I see a uh, female Eivor in any marketing material because I'm just so used to them only showing the male. Even though I'm, as far as I can tell, Eivor may or may not be the actual canon protagonist. Maybe? I don't know. I am really, my expectations for the narrative value of whatever justification they have for the protagonist gender switching is pretty low. Like Darby says they've come up with a good reason. I'm pretty sure they said they came up with a good reason for Alexios and Cassandra. It's not good. There's no good justification for the way that game yeah, works. Yeah, I mean, the you fact that live, your your present that's day super silly the, that spoiler alert your present day character can meet one of them in the real world, and it is either one of those genders that blows open the canon because now there are two alternate yep. Assassin's Creed canons: one where he was a male and one where she's a female. A hundred percent. The only way where the whole meeting the ancestor thing 
could have been neat in a way is if you played as Alexios and then by the end of the game, Cassandra shows up yeah. and then you're like, oh no, it's it's the mean one. And Cassandra's like, what are you talking about? Like, yeah, that, that would have been, cool. been amazing. But you don't want to have nope. all those all those angry boy gamers playing the game and be like, wait a second, the girl was the real one? This is bullshit. I'm <laughs> refunding the game I've already spent full price on that I'm already I, I 60 guess... hours into and therefore cannot refund. You already have their money, Ubisoft, you dumb fucks. You can make Cassandra the main character. You can pull that on people. If you're willing to pull a, 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 a heterosexual relationship on any gay people playing the game, why aren't you willing to pull a canon female character on any men playing the game? Even when they get to play the character. I, 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 it's so ridiculous, dude. I don't think it's a thing to be proud of that they are trying to tap into the incel market, but no. I guess that's what they want to do. I, I don't think it's a thing to be proud of. I think that, and I've, you know, I've talked about this a lot, like on the subreddit and on Twitter lately, but I think that it's purely a matter of attitude. I don't think the data shows that fewer men will buy the game or any such bullshit. Because the truth is, there are female gamers, and there would be more of them if you didn't pull shit like this. Like, take the time and have the consideration to invest in creating a wider market of gamers who can all enjoy your content and start treating them as, as valuable, valid customers and not marketing solely the male options. I mean, I think it's exactly the same as what happened at Marvel. Um, Marvel had an executive, Ike Perlmutter, who was stodgy, dinosaur, sexist, racist motherfucker. And he said, oh, well, women don't sell toys. Kids won't buy toys of female characters. So he steps on the whole plan for Iron Man 3 to have a female villain. And he doesn't allow any, you know, non-white, non-male characters get their own movies. And then, oh, something happens. We got rid of Ike Perlmutter. Captain Marvel and Black Panther make over a billion dollars in the box office because to believe that women or black people don't sell toys is just ridiculous. There is no market research backing that up. It is not true. Same will happen with video games. The moment yeah. that one of these big franchises or a new big franchise is created like Horizon Zero Dawn that like no one is no one's blinking an eye at the fact that there's a female main character of that game. There was not controversy about it. I don't remember there being any fucking raging fanboy assholes. There's no reason Assassin's Creed, a, a series as broad and deep and expansive as this one, can't have a playable woman. There's just no reason. Yeah. Rant over. And although there is a lot of controversy surrounding The Last of Us Part Two, there is no denying the fact that people wanted Ellie and... The fact that that game broke records. Long list sales. of controversies on that game. I don't think any of those controversies are that you play as a female or a lesbian. I don't think anyone cares. They wanted that. They wanted to yeah. continue the story of Ellie. There are a billion other reasons you can be mad about that game, but no one's complaining about the fact that you're playing a lesbian. No one is. No, I don't think so either. Because of all the different choice mechanics, yeah. there are some certain things that can bar you from doing certain side quests in certain ways. And that just kind of stresses it me does. out. It does. It is stressful. Like, when I find out that a game has multiple endings, I get stressed out. And Odyssey, I, mean, I they, tried yeah. two or three times and I could never get the good ending because of something being really easy to fuck up. And uh, the game that made me, like, really stressed out about, like, missing side quests, missing certain content... Uh, was Fable 2 mm. because without going into any spoilers there's a moment in the game where it specifically says hey if you're doing something if you're in the middle of doing something you might want to finish that yeah. before you oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. continue and at the very least it gives you a warning but I, I did not follow the warning the first time I played through the game and I was devastated Ooh, and now it's just like now it's just like, I want to do all the side content as early as possible because I do not want to miss out on anything. Yeah, Ghost of Tsushima pulls out a warning that's very clever because it's like, 
It's not like a, you should finish all this stuff warning. It's like you're about to embark on a really long mission. Like this mission is about to be really long. Do you want oh, to do oh, it? Oh, yeah. And what that, was that, great that's about how it Fable does it as well is that even though it's not like, oh, if I do this mission, someone who gives me side quests might die. It still made me think that was possible. It made me go back and clear up a lot of side quests. Yeah. It, it's just uh, unless there's like a warning or something, it, it's like a, it's it, it makes me feel like a sort of Bethesda game as to where you could just do something in the open world like and you then blow up mistake, Megaton City and have that whole city be gone forever if you want. Yeah, or just like pick up something in the open world and oops, you accidentally fucked up a whole quest yeah. line. Yeah, dude. I when I saw the gameplay demo like do you kill or spare Rued in Valhalla, I'm like, all right, is this going to be like a thing that actually matters because I presume it will and from people who've had more experience with Valhalla it seems like they go really deep on the choices and the way that those things fractalize out and create the narrative. But like, I, I just don't want to be stuck to anything. Like, I don't know. I want to, I want these games to make it easier for you to see the possibilities of what the world looks like in different playthroughs. They usually won't do that because either they don't want you to see how different it could be, or they don't want you to see how similar it is. But I, that's what would make me more comfortable in a game like this to have like a window into the alternate realities I could have created. Yeah, for sure. And it, it, it sucks because sometimes you don't know. And it's just like, do you look it up and get spoiled or yeah. do you go with your gut feeling and mess up the game? Yeah, because I uh, want to have one thing. I want to be able to play a game on its own terms and engage with it naturally the way that I would want to. And I know that's what they want us to do. And on some level. I want to be comfortable with the fact that I'm going to make the choices I make and get the ending I deserve. But the truth is, in a lot of these cases, you're not necessarily going to get the ending you deserve because maybe you don't know what actual choices or what actual mechanic decides the ending. And then you're just going to feel cheated. If your story turns out that you did not earn a really great ending or a really satisfying ending, you're going to feel like you did something wrong. It's not really a, a great feeling, I don't think. Yeah, and one thing that I, I know I've talked about this before, probably with you guys, but I, I, I wish that at the very least there would be a, a setting to choose if they're going to keep on doing this choice stuff to show... I would love it yeah. if even in the codex or the database or whatever they said, while you chose to do this, what actually happened to Eivor was this. That would be fine. I Okay, so... But I, I I just don't think at least in like my like revitalized AC that dialogue choices are around at all. So I don't I don't think that like talking about how like how they could I don't know like I I don't think that any form of compromise would still make me want to play them anymore. So here's my question for you then, Tim. If they do everything else we want them to do, but there are still dialogue choices, how happy are you? But I I think there being dialogue choices kind of makes a lot of what we're talking about here obsolete. I don't think so. Okay, so how can there be a, how can there be an assassin in multiple games if there's choices? If you do it the Mass Effect style, where your previous game saves influence the stories of the future games. If you keep magic and mysticism out, expand on the black box stuff, do all the other things that were on your guys' lists, but then also there are dialogue choices. I don't think any of them are conflicting. Yeah, but I don't see with the way that Ubisoft develops these games that they're actually going to going to do a multiple protagonist game with dialogue choices. I just don't see that happening. I mean, I think they could, but I also don't see that happening. Like, I don't think they're contradictory, but I also don't see them making a multiple protagonist game anyway, you know? Yeah, but I mean, a lot of this stuff is hypothetical it, anyway. I mean... Yeah, it is. If if I may say my... I, I know Ubisoft wants to continue doing the dialogue choices, but I would prefer for them not to. I think we it all doesn't, would. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like a good thing to do in an assassin's creed game and like if they did choices or whatnot i feel like they should be about as deep as red dead 2s yeah red dead 2s are very very shallow choices yeah it's just like do you do the good thing or do you do the bad thing and i think too that that could work it's like i want them to to either like either no asset or full asset don't half asset because like no choices or deep choices are to me better than like choices but not really you know but at the same time like i didn't mind that there were some choices in either red dead or ghost of tsushima like they they could be nice little dialogue changes but 
it's definitely not a choice based game the way that Odyssey is, right? That's true. I, I guess I sort of mean it more so in the sense that based on how you act in the game yeah. could impact some dialogue later and ultimately the ending. And there are multiple endings in uh, Red Dead 2, right? Yeah. And I don't know if I should get into spoilers for that game here, but like... I didn't know until recently that there were multiple endings. So that's a game that did it well for me where I felt like I was getting the ending and my ending was satisfying to me. But when I found out later that there were multiple endings, I looked up what those endings were and I was like, oh, I'm really glad I didn't get that one. Yeah, yeah. And then also depending on uh, how you act, specifically your honor level. Yeah. It changes Some like details. your spirit animal and certain songs and also a lot of dialogue in chapter six. Yeah. Which is all cool. I think that's a great way to sprinkle choice into a game that doesn't have it typically. Yeah. And that's, that would be, I would be okay with seeing Assassin's Creed take that approach. I would, despite what I said about half-assing it. It just, it, it would just make it a game that's not about choice, but has choices in it. And now these games, currently, they are about choice. It's definitely creating some awkwardness in terms of their ability to deliver a cohesive narrative. For sure. There was like a whole side quest story in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. It was like on a pirate island, the woman was named Kira. Do you remember the one I'm talking about, Putrid? I do. Uh, I don't think I played that. When I played it, the first time I played the game, right? I'm playing as Alexios. There's Kyra. We're doing this, you know, stuff. There's this story about um, her her father being the, like, r- ruthless, like, ruler of the island that she's rebelling against. And she doesn't know it's her father. And there's all this sort of tropey stuff. But it was an interesting story. But what made it really interesting to me was that she was a romanceable character. And I said, hell yeah, let's romance this character. Even though, and I knew this at the time she had a boyfriend, right? Ooh. And so it was this thing that it was interesting to me narratively that uh, my character was choosing to engage in this sort of, you know, uh, infidelity. Keep in mind, her boyfriend is like a character in this story and he's got his ambition if he wants to like be promoted to the next high level in his fucking whatever he is, okay? Soldier, I think. The tr- the, the thing is yeah. though, he gets promoted and then the day that he gets promoted, he finds out that his that his girl is cheating on him. He's like, I think she tells him. And then he's like, you and I, we have to fight to the death. And I felt terrible because I liked this character. He just got the thing that he wanted. He's about to have this life with her. And now I have to kill him. Right. That was a very memorable oh, yeah. moment of that story. So when I replayed Odyssey, I thought, how does the story go? when I don't romance her at all. And it ends up that uh, there's no romance. The guy does not get promoted because he decides he doesn't even want to be that thing anymore. And then someone kills him anyway in a completely unmotivated what? random thing. He just gets like poisoned or something. And it's like, oh my these God. stories don't feel like they're different because of choices I made. It feels like they're different because... The, the two versions of oh, these the characters ends, and the, they need to die. The choices made by the two different versions of those characters don't feel like they're the same character. Like in one universe, all he wants is his promotion. In another universe, he doesn't want the promotion. He just decides not to do that job. That didn't feel motivated by a choice I made. It felt like the thing that the game had to do to, to, to be telling a story. So here's two yeah. possible realms where I'm playing this game. In one of them, I've had this really interesting and cool, uh, memorable experience. In another, I don't think I would have ever remembered that story. I would have forgotten about it immediately like I did so many others in Odyssey. Makes me wonder, first off, how many like great stories did I miss because I made the wrong choices? Second off, the thing that made that story memorable and great in the first place was knowing that I made the choice that led to that. Was that satisfying and right. to me on a level that could not be accomplished by a story with, without choice? Because the answer to that is quite possibly. I don't think I would remember that story if it was scripted. I think I remember that story because I felt guilty about choosing to cuck this dude. Yeah. And that is a good argument for there being choices in Assassin's Creed. And also an argument like, against it, right? Yeah. Like I feel like that experience kind of encapsulates my love-hate relationship with the dialogue choices. Because again, like 
I would love to think charitably and assume that the reason so many of these side quest stories are fucking terrible is because the choices I made were bad. I do think there are quests that I, I had there... the thought that I was like, oh, I bet this would have been interesting if I had chosen not to romance this person or not to kill this guy. Yeah, I remember there was a side quest. I think it was like a pre-order bonus mm -hmm. side quest. You had to go around the world and find the Pythagorean theorem and like two other things. <laughs> I never did that because and... I definitely didn't pre-order. <laughs> but it's just like you find these three things and... It's like, oh, I found the Pythagorean theorem. And then there's like two options of like you interpreting these concepts correctly. Like uh, you interpret it correctly or you interpret it in a very incorrect way. But it doesn't matter at all yeah. which you choose. That's the thing. I mean, there are examples of both it working well and working poorly in Odyssey. You can make choices that, okay... You decide to spare this guy's life, and then many hours later, that character comes back in a cutscene, and you're like, wow, I can't believe that I could have killed that guy, and then everything I'm experiencing right now wouldn't be happening. But then, as far as like the ending of the game goes, all that your choices are really amounting to uh, is who is sitting awkwardly around a dinner table in a cutscene, because genuinely, the only thing that's going to change about the way the world is when you're done with that story is who's sitting at the dinner table and like on one level, that's interesting, but it's not the same kind of interesting as like feeling that your choices could have gotten you a different story. I mean, I wanted to redeem Demos every time I played and I've never successfully redeemed Demos and nor have I looked on YouTube to see what happens when you redeem Demos. He, he just becomes part of your crew. Yeah. I mean, that's going to be it, right? So yep. these choices are, your family's on your ship. are at once both incredibly superficial and incredibly pa like, like they, they, they can lead to interesting. They things. change a lot. Like your, your choices are not telltale choices where it's all illusion. There, there was a minor detail that I really, really enjoyed. So it was on the first Island mm -hmm. where you learn about faction rule and how to, it was Kefalonia. <laughs> No, it was it, it was this it's like the second place you're supposed to go to in the story, I believe, yeah. uh, where you met your quote unquote father and you learn how to stop the influence of the Athenians to get Spartan control. Yeah. But there's an area there that is taken over by uh, it's like a church or something where the cultists have, I guess, taken over and you can kill the cultists in the open world. Or you could just, like, stealthily kill them all and, like, hide the bodies. Mm -hmm. But if you openly killed them, um, when you get to the point in the story where you infiltrate the cultist meeting, and it's, like, the first time you see Demos, um, if you openly killed the cultists in that area, yeah. you'll see, like, the priest that was from that building, like, being tortured. And interrogated by the cultists. Yeah. It's like, it, it was a little thing that I thought was very cool. Yeah. No, for sure. That's a great point. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I, I love when it's done well and when you have those good moments. And it's sad that they kind of have to contort things, like, in order to ensure that, you know, you play out the side quest. There's one side quest that sticks out in my mind because it actually was broken in my first playthrough of the game when I played on my PS4. Um, there's a side quest called I Diona that leads to a cultist. Therefore it's, you know, part of the game and it was just broken on my copy. And there was no update in, uh, over a year after it came out, there was no update that fixed that, that side quest. So I never got to finish wow. the cultist story on my first playthrough. It took me getting it on PC and playing it there to actually finally complete that side quest. Do you remember what broke it? Um, yeah, I remember the glitch. It was. Um, Diona, the side character is telling you, oh, I have to get to, uh, the city and then they just stop following you. So they're just standing in the, in the street, um, essentially being like, and the glitch was, it, it was created by if you got into a fight. So if you got into a fight with, you know, guards while you were walking with her, she would never get back to being on the path to follow you to that location. And you could, if you wanted to, spend two hours sitting there 
slowly nudging her NPC across that entire length of distance to get her into the place where the next thing happened. But I was not (laughs) going to do that. So I had high expectations for the side quest when I replayed the game. And it was pretty bad because as far as my choices went, um, she was being like really affectionate and, and like sexual flirting with with me. And I was like, okay, sure, because I, I kind of just, like, I, I don't have, like, a, a philosophy on romance choices where I'm like, oh, I'm straight or gay or anything like that. I just kind of like, oh, if the character expresses interest in me, then I'll do it. But if they don't, I won't express interest in them. That was kind of what I did. So based on that, I, I slept with Diona and then found out that Diona was the bad guy that I was after, technically. But it wasn't because she was a twin. So there were two of her. Okay? Are you remembering this now if you completed the cultist? Oh, yeah, yeah. And she's like manipulating you the whole yeah, time. Yeah, and it's stupid because then you're like looking at two copies of the same NPC and it's like, which one's the good one and which one's the bad one? And I was like, this is like, I, I have no, I, I thought really carefully. I listened to what they were saying. I was trying to make an informed decision. Of course, I killed the wrong one. And it's like, ha ha, you killed the good one. Now go kill the bad one. But I really wonder, and I don't know, I haven't looked up to confirm this. I really wonder if you could kill the right one off the bat, or if either one you selected would just say, oh no, we're the good one. That's a good point. Because I think they would be the kind of developers in this case to be like, oh, we would rather make you feel bad about a choice you made than actually give you a real choice, which is what a lot of the choices boil down to. It's like, ha ha. You thought you were doing the right thing, and then you accidentally became an asshole. Yeah. I still remember there was, like, a side mission where the most rewarding thing to do was to, like, cuck a guy. (laughs) Because his wife was like, oh, he can't can't last as long because she's like yeah crazy into sex or whatever. Yeah, it's like an old woman, too. And she's like, my husband can't keep up. And then your husband is like, please fuck my wife. Please fuck yeah, my he, wife. And he's just like, you go, <laughs> once you're done with your little session, he's just like, thank you. Here's a blade. <laughs> it was so Here's like weird. my custom made blade to give you as thanks. <laughs> and like, if, if you refuse to cuck him, he's just like, oh no. Now I have to fuck my wife. <laughs> So it's so bizarre, but I'm really hoping that Valhalla is going to be able to, like, flesh these choices out. I, I, I do like the idea of, rather than just, like, all the romance things being one-night stands. There are longer-term The idea of now. being able to have more long-term and relationships, that sounds cool. And as, uh, as our buddy cool. Finn pointed out, as Treviso said, it's basically an Ashraf simulator. Because you can have a long-term relationship, <laughs> but still have, like, a, a dozen side pieces going. Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh boy. That's when when art imitates life. <laughs> Origins, he made it about the death of his son. Now Valhalla, he makes it about his being a serial philanderer. I don't know. Hey Tim, are you alive? I'm alive. You're just so um disgusted by the idea of dialogue choices you set out this conversation. I just don't really have much to say. Just about a lot about Odyssey, yeah. which I can't yeah, you didn't play Odyssey. Fucking yeah, and I apologize for talking about no, Odyssey. No, no, for no, so no long. it's okay. I think that gives me <laughs> if I split this up into two, I feel like this will be like a dialogue choices episode almost. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the Hookblade Podcast. As always, there are things you can do to support us. You can send us a letter in the mail. Um, you can have a carrier pigeon deliver your words of praise and enjoyment. Really, at the end of the day, um, interact with us, hit us up in the comments, hit us up on Twitter, uh, tell us what you think about what we talked about. Um, This week, actually, if you guys wouldn't mind, let us know some of the things that you would like to hear us talk about on future episodes, because um, we're we're very, very stupid and we're running out of ideas. So if you can suggest things that make a good episode, we will shout you out in that episode for all uh, five of our listeners. Thank you again for for joining us on this journey, Putrid. Thank you so much. No problem. It's been fun. Thanks for having me on. That wraps it up for this week. We will see you next time.